church that meets here at Malden. We're glad each one of you back here with us tonight. We've got just a few announcements before we begin our worship service. Uh, let's remember all of our shut-ins that's in our bulletin. Let's remember our sick. Also, uh, it was good to see Jean Chapman back with us today. And I read a uh, thank you card she had sent this morning. I put it up in the in the foyer, I put it on the bulletin board so if anybody would like to read it again. Oh, <clears throat> Kathy Dusty gave me this uh, she wrote a prayer request this morning. The uh, Price family, it's neighbor, her neighbors, it's Janet and Cliff Price. They was in a car accident yesterday and the Janet was killed. And also a friend of hers, Joyce Kramer from Illinois, she, uh, she's had cancer. Let's remember that families in our prayer. Also, uh, <clears throat> Joe's sister-in-law would be his brother, uh, Doug, his wife, Kathy, and she's been here before. I, I saw me, she, probably most of you would recognize her if you've seen her. She passed away this past Friday, so let's remember that family also in our prayers. And <clears throat> in the bulletin, uh, under the brunch and ornament exchange, it's got December the 2nd. It's December the 10th, so keep that. Change that in your bulletin. And Monday night will be the uh, prayer meeting. It's at 7 o'clock. That'll be this Monday night coming. And also ladies Bible class is coming Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. I think that's all. Uh, into our worship service tonight, our song leader will be Joel Foster, our lesson by Dennis Strine, our closing prayer by Joel Maddox, and we'll begin our <coughs> worship service with opening prayer that will be Joel Foster. Bow with me, please. 
Our Father, we're thankful this evening to have the opportunity once again to come here to worship you. We pray that you'd be with each of us, that we can focus on your word, on your son, that we can worship you, and that you will be glorified by our worship and we will be uplifted. <clears throat> Father, we're thankful for this church, the church the world over. Once again, we're thankful for our veterans and what they have sacrificed in their lives so that we can be safe in this country. We pray your continued blessings upon them. For those that are in need of our prayers, for those that are sick, we pray that you be with them, be with the doctors and those that help treat them that they will be restored to their health. Father, we're, we're so thankful for those that have seen a restoration to their health, and we pray that that restoration will continue. For those that are bereaved, Father, we pray that you will be with, with them, for the Mormon family, for the Price family, and others that have lost loved ones. Lay your comforting hand on them, comfort them as only you can. We pray this evening that you'll be with Brother Dennis as he <clears throat> brings us the message that he's prepared, that we will open our minds and take those things in, take them with us, use those things in the upcoming week. We pray that you'd continue to bless this church, Father, that we can stand for your truth, that we can set aside those things that are contrary to your word and follow after your precepts, that we can be a light in a lost world, Father. We pray that you'd be with us in this upcoming week. Satan is powerful, throws his temptations at us constantly. We pray that you can help us to overcome those things. And when we do fail, Father, we ask that you forgive us, because we do fail often, Father as being weak mortal men. But we're thankful for Jesus who placed himself in our place even though he did not deserve it, but he gave the sacrifice so that we might have that hope of an eternal salvation. Be with us, Father, as we sing these songs. We pray that we'll focus on the words, take those things in as we teach and admonish one another. In all things, Father, your will be done. For we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Shame to own my Lord, nor to defend his cause. Maintain the honors of his word, the glory of his cross. Jesus, my God, I know his name, his name is all my trust. No Six. 
There's not a friend to me, lead Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else can heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Our hymn of encouragement this evening is 159. 159. And before Dennis comes to speak to us, 438. 438. Mm-hmm. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Well, if you'll open your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4, we'll start actually in verse 1. We'll read through verse 6. 
What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts as righteousness apart from works. <coughs> Verse 7, it says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count as sin. We have a lot of misunderstanding regarding the subject of righteousness. At its foundation, righteous means to be correct. And the word righteousness is the state of having been found correct. And we don't use that word very often in our common speech. We do use the term almost exclusively in the context of religion. As an example of this, if a person is acquitted on a legal charge, is said to be righteous. And also in acting toward one's fellow's man, if one did good deeds, that one was also said to be righteous. But the problem comes with us describing one's relationship with God. For how can we say that man can be righteous before God? That is being acquitted of charges or to do good deeds toward God. We understand that we cannot merit our own salvation. We cannot be acquitted of the sin of, of the charge of sin on our own. And this is basically Paul's point in Romans 4. But why do acts have to be counted for righteousness? Why can't we just be righteous? To put it very simply, because man has sinned. We've heard the saying that 99 attaboys go away when there's one uh-oh. And that is the same as true. One person can be righteous in all things but sin one time, and it negates all the good things that one has done. D David writes in Psalm 143 in verse 2, says, Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one is righteous before you. Paul says something similar in Romans 3 and verse 10, that none is righteous, no, not one. Because of our sins, we cannot, as such, be righteous. However, our actions can be counted for righteousness under the proper circumstances. But first, we'll start with what does not get counted for righteousness. Right deeds that we do thinking that these deeds will merit salvation. I'll turn to Romans 9 and verses 30 and 33 that will help us to understand what I mean by this. Now Paul writes here, What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued the law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching the law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it was based on works. They have stumbled over a stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Let's say a rich man on his own goes out and helps an orphanage. And he boasts about that work. Is he righteous? No. 
But if that same man goes out and, and helps an orphanage out and gives the credit to God, and he does it because he understands by faith that God wants us to take care of orphans, then yes, he is justified and is righteous. See, our works of righteousness is only counted as righteousness if we are doing it for the right reasons and out of obedience to God by faith. Paul is alluding in Romans chapter 9 that man has engineered systems of salvation that God has not ordained and authorized. This is why Jesus had said in Matthew 15 and verse 9, in vain do they worship me, teaching doctrines as the commandments of men. Again, in Romans 10, in the first four verses, Paul writes, Brothers, my heart desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone that believes. Mankind throughout the ages, from the very beginning, we can even start back with Cain, have attempted to replace what God has commanded with what man wants to do. It doesn't matter how honorable the reasons are, but if it isn't from God, we can't count it as righteousness. We are involved in sinful activities. We're not counted as righteous. For James, in James chapter 1, verse 20, James wrote here, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. <coughs> but what does count for righteousness? I guess the first and foremost is that Jesus' life was counted for righteousness because he lived that sinful life. As Paul said in Romans 5 and verse 19, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And Paul alludes to the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Today, when we submit to the will of God through Christ, we can be counted as righteous. We do this through our acts of obedience. For in the first six verses of Romans chapter 8, I'm sorry, Romans 6 and verses 16 through 18. Paul said here, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom they obey, either of sin which leads to death or obedience which leads to righteousness? We can be found righteous through our acts of faith, for it is written in Philippians 3 and verses 8 and 9. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now, we have two great examples in the Bible of righteousness. Uh, the first one being Noah himself. In Genesis 6 and verse 9, it tells us that Noah was a righteous man. But what we need to understand is that Noah's righteousness did not preclude God's grace, as we read in Genesis 6 and, and verse 8 where it says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah's righteousness also did not preclude 
God's commandments. In Genesis 6 and verse 22, it says that Noah did this. He did all that God commanded. He had the faith. He had a willingness to obey God's commandments. And for all the weakness in the world, at that time, Genesis 7 verse 1 says that then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark. You and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. In that great faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 7, we read of Noah's obedience and faith. Those two things that we mentioned earlier as a prerequisite of righteousness. By faith, Noah being warned of God by God concerning the events as yet seen. In reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. He believed everything God had spoken. He believed that it would happen. And because of that belief, that faith in God, he obeyed God's commandments. The next one that we have is Abraham. In the first of five verses of Genesis chapter 15, God promises Jesus or Abraham children, children of his own, not from a second wife, but from Sarah. In verse 6, it says that he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. In the first eight verses of Romans chapter 4 tells us that if Abraham was justified by works, that he might have worldly glory, but not the glory of God. See, Abraham wasn't justified by his works. It was his faith in God that counted Abraham as righteous. In James chapter 2 and verses 21 through 24 tells us that Abraham's righteousness was fulfilled when he offered Isaac. He obeyed God's commands to the letter, and it was his faith that counted him as righteous before God. This, through these two examples, is what is needed to be righteous in the sight of God. We do have some misconceptions of what righteousness is and the doctrine of righteousness. We can't perform a righteous act. Well, Paul wrote in Romans 3 and verse 10 that none is righteous, no, not one. What Paul really means here is that we cannot on our own be righteous before God. Only when we act on our faith and our obedience with God's word, then we act righteously. And God accounts such acts of righteousness not out of any merit within us or an act of what we're doing, but because Jesus authorized those acts to be righteous within his covenant. In Romans chapter 6, if you'll turn there, verses 6, 17 through 19, Paul said, but thanks be to God that you were once slaves to sin and have become obedient from the heart to the standards of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. He goes on to say, but I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness and sanctification. Any work that we do is a work of merit. And it cannot be counted for righteousness. In Paul's letter to Titus in chapter 3 and verse 5, it reads that he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now, 
This doesn't say that every work that we do is a work that can't be righteous. But when we put our trust in our own works, or we create a work as a substitute to Christ's will, then we will have created our own righteousness and that God will never accept. But when we put our faith, our trust, our obedience in Christ, and then do these works, and they are Christ's works of righteousness, because he has ordained it through his will and not ours. A Hebrew writer in Hebrews 10, verse 38, he wrote, But my righteousness, one that shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. There's another doctrine out there, a doctrine of imputed or transferred righteous states. It says that no man can never do a righteous deed because of his sin. So God must look upon Jesus' personal righteousness as a substitution of man. But what this doctrine does not take into account is the fact that Christ's righteousness is not his own personal righteousness. It is a system of salvation that Christ bought for man by his own blood. Romans 1 verses 16 and 17 tells us that his righteousness is found in the gospel. That when we act in faith, when we act in obedience to Christ's covenant, God accounts that act for righteousness because we are trusting in Christ's covenant to be saved. Now, how many times have we mentioned that this water behind us is from the Greenville water system? <clears throat> More than likely, it came from Table Rock. Nothing about that water. How can that save us from sin? It is our faith, it's our obedience in that watery grave that saves us, not the water itself. Hebrews 5 and verse 9 reads, And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Friends, if we want to be counted as righteous in the sight of God, then we must be faithful. And we must be obedient to God's commandments. We must not be deceived by those outside on this issue. And we must remember what John wrote in 1 John chapter 1, or chapter 3 and verse 7, where he said, My little children, let no man deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Are we living righteously before God? Is what we do every day, every act that we do, every work that we do, it is it based upon our faith in God? Is it based upon God's commandments? Or do we do it for ourselves? Are we living righteously before God? Do we have that right relationship with Him? Tonight, if you're not a Christian, you can, this night, be counted as righteous before God before you leave here this evening. By submitting to His will, by obeying the gospel, by repenting of your sins, by confessing Him before men, and having your sins washed away in New Testament baptism, you can be counted as righteous. That is faith. That is obedience. And if you are a child of God and, and you have been slipping by the wayside and you fear and you're worried that you will not be counted as righteous in the sight of God, you can mend that fence tonight. If there's anyone that has a need, regardless of what it is, won't you come as together?
We stand and we sing. Free from the law, oh, happy condition, Jesus has fled, and there is remission, cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, grace has redeemed us once for all, once for all. appreciate all of you being here this evening, and I hope you have a, a great, wonderful week. Our prayer meeting is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, so please keep that on your calendar. If you can be here, it would be greatly appreciated. And if there's nothing further by anybody, David? Katie's sick today. Who's sick? Katie. Yeah, Katie, Katie's uh, been coming off an ear infection, and, and I'm suspecting probably the flu, too. Uh, so she's uh, still quite under the weather yet, so uh, please keep her in your prayers. At this time, we'll be dismissed with prayer. Most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all the many blessings that you have given us throughout our lives. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to come here tonight and sing songs of praise unto you, to hear a portion of our words spoken by you. We pray that we will take the things we have heard here tonight, apply them to our lives, and become stronger Christians. Go out and teach thy word, be example to others. We pray that you would be with the Christ family, the Mormon family, as they have lost a loved one, that you would comfort them as only you know how. We pray that you would be with the one that was mentioned that has cancer. We pray that you would be with the ones that have recovered from surgery. We pray that you would be with them and the doctors that will be taking care of them in the future. We pray that you will be with the ones that are sick, be with the one our shut-ins, that you would watch over them also. We pray that you would always watch over us, that you would guide, guard, and direct us throughout our lives. Forgive us for our sins, Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.